It's always a pleasure to, to come here, and, and uh, I'm glad to see all this emphasis on STEM. And as Don has mentioned, I'm from the S in STEM, the, the science side of it. And uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, geology these days, you know, study the Earth. People come from a lot of different perspectives. They can come in from chemistry, come in from physics, come in from groundwater. Uh, I'm kind of mainline. I'm, I'm a rock guy, sedimentary rock guy, sands, limestones, conglomerates, the things that have fossils in it. And for, uh, for a STEM group here who is already positively oriented to science, thank you, I appreciate that, but it, sometimes audiences aren't, and then I just list myself as a historian because geology really is this, not only the study of the earth, but it is the history of the earth. And uh, that's one of the, our biggest contributions to human thought or human understanding of life on earth is simply, simply time. The time scale of the earth has just greatly affected uh, many, many other things, including just, just thought. And I thought what we do today here is, is uh, go back to the early earth for our start and then jump up to the modern. So in other words, we don't have enough time to go all the way through from the beginning of the earth to the end, unless you want to sign up for the semester course. Uh, if it's just tonight, then we'll start at the beginning and then jump to the end and get some idea. And one of the things we always hear about is carbon dioxide. Not that that's the only thing affecting climate, but carbon dioxide uh, has become sort of the poster child for global warming. And I don't even want to get in. I'm, no politics here. No recommendations. I'm not going to tell you you must do this or you must stop doing that. We're just going to seek to understand carbon dioxide, uh, some of its role in Earth history. Just the pure science of it. Uh, no politics. Now, one of the other beautiful things about uh, the geology, before I go into that specifically, I can remember when I was an undergraduate out here at San Diego State College, and uh, my, some of my friends, my fraternity brothers, some of us who were in the STEM end of things, it seemed like we were spending a lot more time studying and working a lot harder than some of our uh, compatriots. But I want to tell you that uh, that extra effort has really paid off. Uh, when I was an undergrad, you know, you take this class and that one, and this one's difficult, and that one, and that one, and it's just like one tough class after another. But the beauty of it is, as you go on, after a while, these, these different topics that, you, that, I, that I had to, you know, work very hard to get through, they start to merge. And as they start to merge, you end up with a whole. And uh, for myself now, and I don't mean this in any psychic or mystic way, but by the time you understand enough of the biology, the physics, the chemistry, and the geology, it kind of gives you a feeling of being in tune with the Earth. You kind of know what's going to happen and all. And it's been a great, great satisfaction to me. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I'll never retire. What I do is so interesting. Why would I want to quit doing it? And it's because you kind of achieved or reached a role where, a place where you're getting a lot of added benefits from it beyond just the money you're paid or stuff like that. So what I thought I'd do tonight then, a couple years ago we talked about uh, earthquakes, but tonight I thought carbon dioxide in earth history. And let's, when we talk about history, let's talk about this a little bit here. We're going to do, here's a table here with ages and millions of the years. So this is billion. So how old is the universe? Well, it's at least 13.8 billion years old. And that's only because that's as far as we can see or know. It's, it, who knows how much farther it goes? I'm sure we're not at the end of it. For the Earth itself, 4,570 million years old, four and a half billion years old. And this is one of the things I'm going to be emphasizing tonight is to understand the Earth, you must think over long lengths of time. When I say we are a historical science, this is a part of that history aspect is uh, change over time. And let me go on all the way down to the end here <clears throat> for, for uh, our species. We've been around for about 200,000 years. So when you look at us and compare that to the age of the Earth, we're a very late stage addition to the game. And in terms of understanding the Earth, uh, I, I personally look at it, or the way I write it up, is our understanding of the Earth actually really begins in 1785 in Scotland. Or in other words, how long have we understood something about the Earth? Well, there you are, about 233 years, uh, 1785 to present. So we're really dealing with, uh, we're going to start off talking about this part of the Earth, then we're going to jump up here to, to the modern times. Now, if we go back here on these ancient climates, early greenhouse, the greenhouse effect, if we look here now at the early Earth, let's look first here, here's, here's our planets. Venus, the second planet from the Sun, 
Earth the third planet, and Mars the fourth planet. And one of the things about Venus, of course, since it's closer to the sun, it's hotter. But look at that atmosphere. It's 96.5% uh, carbon dioxide. Look at Mars out here, over 95% carbon dioxide. And I've got to prove this, because this is science. Right now, I've just got the number up here. The early Earth is saying it's 98% carbon dioxide. And I, and I trust you're sitting there saying, how do you know that? Why should I accept that? Well, we're, we're, we're going to work on that, because this, this is science. But what I wanted to do here was establish something about this early Earth uh, uh, greenhouse effect, which is, uh, well, let's look at what temperatures would be like at that time. If we were here at the early Earth, if we were here four and a half billion years ago, the Earth's temperature would be, that's the surface temperature, 290 degrees centigrade, which would be what, over 500 degrees Fahrenheit? You think about life as we know it, what, what would we be doing if the temperature outside now was 500 degrees? In other words, here's this greenhouse effect on a mega time scale. This isn't the politicians or the people bickering about you know, what goes on in this town or in this company or something or other. We look at the Earth as a whole. The Earth started out as a huge, huge greenhouse. Life as we know it, not really possible at that time. So what has happened? How can you make a statement like that? If there was that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's not there now, this is, this is out of date here, keeping up with the amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere, it's, I have to change the slides so often, 0.038%, uh, well now it's 0.045%. Uh, it goes up every year with all the stuff we're putting in the atmosphere. But look at the difference, 98% versus here where we're just a fraction of 1%. So when we're talking about loading the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not that much at all. For temperature, uh, the average Earth temperature now is about 16 degrees, that'd be centigrade, so that would be what, uh, 61 degrees Fahrenheit? If we took this out of the atmosphere, so we had no carbon dioxide, uh, in other words, we, we are a benefit of a greenhouse effect. This is giving us a greenhouse effect right now. Without that in the atmosphere, the average temperature would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. We'd still be alive, but I mean 61 degrees is a lot more comfortable than, than zero for an average temperature. So in terms of greenhouse effect, this is something that has always been part of the Earth, not something that's just popped up now. Now, the real question is, uh, <coughs> If all of that carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere, how did it get out? Photosynthesis, life took it out. Now let me show you, You're, that you've done this formula many, many years, many classes, you know, plants, photosynthetic plants will take in carbon dioxide and water, heat from the sun, and then they'll make, well, they'll make the plant. I just happen to use the simple molecule, uh, molecule glucose here, uh, what, C6H12O6, and then give off oxygen. So. I didn't really focus on that before, but not only now with photosynthesis are we taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but we're also putting oxygen in it. Let me just back up here real fast and look at that early Earth. Early Earth, oxygen, simply a trace. So again, not only the temperature controlling life as we know it, what would we do if we only had a trace of oxygen? At the same time the plants are taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they were putting in the oxygen that, well, leads to things like us. Now, this busy, busy table, I just want to focus on one thing here. That what I'm working on right now is, where did that carbon dioxide that was in the Earth's atmosphere, where'd it go? It doesn't disappear, where is it? And the biggie down here is limestone. Limestone, it's been pulled out. We're gonna go over this in some detail now. It's been pulled out of the, the gaseous carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which also dissolves into the water, as we will look at. They've been pulled out of the air and out of the water by organisms and stored here in solid. And the reason this number, even though it's a ballpark figure, the reason we even know that is, well, limestone, this is part of the cornerstone of our, our civilization. You know, what, what are our buildings built of here? The concrete and all. What is it that makes the concrete? The most important ingredient is what? Ground up limestone. So in other words, this is, this is uh, estimates are, they have an economic base to it. People want to know how much there is and where it is because civilization, basically, it's a basic building material. So, early Earth, atmosphere, loaded with so much carbon dioxide we wouldn't even be alive. Photosynthetic plants have pulled it out and it's stored now as a solid 
as limestone. And I want to get into limestones a little bit. And uh, this, I know this little statement's kind of kind of cute, but uh, uh, I didn't make it up. I, I borrowed it from borrowed it. But these are all kinds of fossils and all you see right here. So we're just saying limestones are different than other rocks. You know, when you're when you're in Don Berry's class and you're learning about volcanic rocks and metamorphic rocks and granitic rocks and those sorts of things. Uh, Life doesn't exist under those high temperatures and pressures. Where does life exist? In the kinds of conditions that we're used to, the low temperatures and low pressures. And so when we look at a limestone, you see all these little, little fossils in here? These are all little, little shells. And then the brownish fine stuff in there is, is, is little bits of uh, calcium carbonate that are inside like green algae inside of plants. So in other words, this rock is made of former organisms. If we buried this rock deeply, and stuck a drill in it, under heat and pressure, this would be oil. Oil or natural gas. So in other words, we're looking at uh, basically the stored remains of life here. Now, here's a, uh, uh, as Don mentioned, I, I lead trips around the world for uh, Smithsonian, uh, all continents, all oceans. And here's a, a cool one I ran into in Patagonian Chile. Here's, here's this Laguna Larga. And <clears throat> What we find in this particular lake, this is where up here in a, in a glacial area and all, if we find in this lake here, we don't have the usual set of animals. We don't have the worms, we don't have the snails, we don't have the clams and all. So it's, this is like lakes used to be before things like clams and snails existed. And the interesting thing here, what, what, what I was so excited to see is, we're going to focus on this dark stuff, that's the living organisms, and this word, you don't have to memorize this word, but these are called thrombolites. The main point is, that's limestone. That's calcium carbonate that's been pulled out of the water and made into solid material here. The real organisms are just these kinds of things that you don't get a lot of appreciation for, right? You don't see the individual organisms real well. When you touch them, they're just kind of, you know, uh, slippery, you know, you know these kinds of things. Maybe the closest thing to do it would be to the kinds of uh, green uh, cyanobacteria you see like in a, a, a lake or in a swimming pool that hasn't been well maintained. But these kinds of organisms in the early Earth, these have been around in the fossil record. We know them from 3.5 billion years, 3,500 million years worth of these organisms living, especially at a time when they're not eaten. They're not so abundant now because it's food for all these other animals we're talking about, the snails and the worms and so forth. So they're not as abundant in that, as they used to be. But now let's bring up an important point here about these things. I mentioned, I mentioned about geology being a historical science. To understand geology, understand the Earth, you have to think about changes over a long length of time. So I would say one of the key principles in geology, the key things to understanding the Earth, is to take small changes and then take a small change and do it over a long, long length of time to add up to a major result. Let's go back to our early Earth atmosphere. 98% carbon dioxide. And how do we calculate the 98%? That's because we know the volume of the limestone. Then you just do a reverse calculation. If we crunched up all of that uh, solid limestone, put it back to gas, how much carbon dioxide would be in the atmosphere. Well, you look at these, these are not organisms that get real impressive. I know when I, when I lead people there, uh, I have to get, I have to almost become a religious type thing of saying, <laughs> these are your ancestors. If it was not for these organisms, you wouldn't even be alive. There would be no oxygen in the atmosphere. The temperature would have been too hot. You owe your existence to these, these organisms. So venerate them, appreciate them. But how do they do their work? Nothing dramatic, right? It's photosynthesis, and then it has to go on millions of years, millions after millions after millions, and that's how we understand the Earth. Slow changes, small changes, over long lengths of time add up to major results. So in the world of calcium carbonate, um, if you've had uh, 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 one of the geology classes here. Uh, uh, I've just taken that calcium carbonate, and the, the, the carbonate here, that CO2 is in here. That's the CO2. So the mineral calcite, the rock limestone, 
Uh, mineralized tissue, fancy word for what, coral reefs, clams, and then if you bury it and put heat under it, limestone turns into marble. But all of that is just stored carbon dioxide, pulled out of the atmosphere and stored in, in solid form. So this word coquina, it's just uh, from, from Florida, a whole bunch of shell fragments on a beach that have been kind of cemented together by more calcium carbonate. The Great Barrier Reef of Australia, man, that's a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide pulled out of the atmosphere. Belize Barrier Reef, the pyramids in Egypt made out of blocks of limestone. And uh, <clears throat> that's why whenever you go on a trip, you take your little 10 magnification hand lens with you. Now, one of the cool things when you walk up to this, these things and look at them, you'll find, you know what, foraminifera, you know, for, 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 forams? L little ones there that almost as big as a dime. And you go with your hand lens and look at these, these, uh, this, these, this is a stack of little tiny fossils is what it boils down to. Now, I'm not trying to change the view of Egyptian history. We're just trying to add another element. You get a little more richness out of our views of the things that we're seeing. So what I want to do here is just the basic formula here for making limestone. Calcium, a common ion in water, bicarbonate, very common. And that will give us, this is limestone and here's carbonic acid. Uh, <clears throat> so the carbonic acid now, H2CO3, what this is very simply, I'll show you on the next slide, what is carbonic acid? It's simply water plus carbon dioxide makes carbonic acid. Now, we've been talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you know, you talk about things like, you know, you have a rainfall. You say, oh, here's a drop of pure water falling, a rainfall falling through the sky down to the earth, pure, clean water. No, no. I mean, yes, it's pure and clean, but it's not just water. Carbon dioxide is dissolved in water so readily that a drop of rain falling through the atmosphere will absorb enough carbon dioxide that, that scientifically it's a dilute carbonic acid. And a carbonic acid, this is nothing fancy. This is, this is the bubbles in your 7-Up. This is the bubbles in the mineral water. This is the bubbles, in other words, carbon dioxide and water. They just easily equilibrate. Now, uh, just for a brief segue here, they talk a lot about, for people that are, uh, want to argue about global warming, they say, well, you release so much carbon dioxide, their temperature should be high, higher. Why isn't it higher? The answer is very simple. What is 71% of the surface of the Earth is ocean? The atmosphere in touch with the ocean, what happens to the carbon dioxide? At least half of it dissolves and goes into the water where it's stored. Well, we'll talk about some of those things. So here's carbonic acid. Now let's, let's move on here a little bit. Again, I'm updating one of these things. Here's we're measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is done at Mauna Loa, uh, top of Mauna Loa, the big mountain in um, uh, big Island of Hawaii. And here's 320 parts per million. Here's 1960. And you look at the change. I just added this arrow here to get up to where we are now at 405. Here's this constant increase. And the up and down is seasonal. The amount of photosynthetic activity is not a constant every month of the year. But you see that upward trend. And that's largely us that's putting that extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, uh, the carbon dioxide, remember, goes into, into, into water, and so <clears throat> we're going to make, as the carbon dioxide content goes up in the atmosphere, carbonic acid content goes up in the oceans, and that means it's going to dissolve limestone. If we increase the acid, we're going to dissolve the limestone, and we're going to go back to the ions that made it up. Okay, every chemical equation is reversible, right? What's driving these things right now in the world? Carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, the more that goes into the water, the more acid we have. Now here is just, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but pH, the acidity, here's highly acid here, here's very basic, and here's the three main things. So here's the acid, carbonic acid, here's bicarbonate, and here's where we basically are in the world, primarily in waters right in here around 7 and 8 pH, and then here's carbonate, very, very alkaline. But the reason I'm mentioning some of this, we want to see something about shifts. That little yellow arrow right there, we actually have already, this is not usually talked about that much, they really talk so much about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the pH of the oceans is actually measurably 
more acidic than it was 50 years ago. And now to me, that is shocking. If you look at the ocean being 71% of the surface of the Earth with an average depth of three miles, think about the volume of that. When you talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is a trivial little, well, you know, that's not very impressive, right? You can't even feel it or even see it. How much carbon dioxide is in there compared to how much can you store in that tremendous volume of water? Three miles deep, 71% of the coverage of the Earth, that's where the carbon dioxide is. A lot of the carbon dioxide we're putting in now is being stored in the oceans, and I'm sure future generations will thank us mightily for sending them all that carbon dioxide their way. But we actually are making the oceans more acid with the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And this is this thing here, uh, ocean acidification, and I like to call it the evil twin of global warming. You don't hear about that, but what, do, what are things you do hear about? You hear about things like, uh, you hear about things like, in the news all the time now, about coral bleaching. There's great die-offs on the Great Barrier Reef in, in, in Australia. And anybody who's working with corals talking about bleaching, unprecedented die-offs. Well, what is the equation? If we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and more of that goes into the water, and we increase the carbonic acid, what happens? It gets buffered out. And let's talk about buffer systems now. So here's one everybody knows. Solid ice, solid water, liquid water, water vapor. So as things warm, we, we melt more ice. So we go back and forth over the solid liquid gas thing to buffer out the climate. If we have excess heat, then we melt ice, and we use up a lot of that excess heat. If we need more heat, then we have uh, more water vapor go out being from gas to liquid, right? We go back and forth. It's a buffer system. It helps regulate the temperature on Earth. This is part of our day-to-day -day experience. But here's the other one. We're putting more carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere, more carbonic acid. How do you neutralize or, 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 or uh, buffer or balance this out? You dissolve limestone. What's the limestone in the, in the oceans? The Great Barrier Reef of Australia, the other coral reefs. So they are, they, are, they are being dissolved. That's why I call it the evil twin of global warming. They talk about global warming all the time. They're not talking about the fact that there's, there's, there's much going on in the ocean. You just have to go below the water level to see it. It's one and the same story. OK, so what I thought I'd do here, just for a brief, brief bit here, uh, Don Barry brought in a few samples to us. These are things that are familiar with you. Here's a, here are just nice, nice oyster. Oh, would you like to order that one? <laughs> so I don't have to tell you what an oyster is or try to study to appreciate it, but I want another, add another perspective to, up to what this oyster is. What is this? This is global cooling. This oyster had to pull a lot of CO2 out of the water to be able to make that solid. So the solid of this oyster has reduced the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's helped make the earth cooler. And the same goes here for the limestones. The limestones, uh, uh, Don brought us a very nice piece here. Uh, I, I probably should have come look at these things in a while right now. But see, it's, it's mainly just made of, of shells. And we're saying limestones are largely born, not made, in that cute little saying. So it's, it's the remains of organisms, but again, Here's that. Look at the shells. I appreciate the organisms and all. But again, this was CO2 in the atmosphere at one point. And then not all that limestone stays at the surface. If it gets buried deeply, the heat and temperature metamorphoses metamorphoses becomes a metamorphic rock. It changes. And so still calcium carbonate, chemically it's the same. It's still that CO2 stored in there. There's another little thing of appreciation. When you're in that museum and you see that, that beautiful sculpture out of marble, or you see marble uh, uh, around the uh, fireplace, and so those sorts of things, appreciate it the same way you always have, but also think about the fact that that's storing a lot of the carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere. How do we get that temperature down? How did we get from 500 degrees temperature down to the, the 61 we're used to now? How do we do that? We did that by organisms taking that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, taking it out of the ox out of the ocean, water, and make it into a solid where it sits for us now and allows us to live in the comfortable temperatures we're used to. 
Okay. Four, so we have photosynthetic organisms three and a half billion years ago. The abundant fossil record begins 541 million years ago. So to round the numbers off, three and a half billion years going to 500 million years, then what? That's almost three billion years of photosynthetic organisms pulling carbon dioxide out and putting oxygen into the atmosphere to create the conditions that we consider to be Earth. And so again, to appreciate it, I'm emphasizing the point over and over again, you have to visualize things over the long, long time span. Nothing catastrophic happens, nothing dramatic happens. Those individual organisms photosynthesizing, there's nothing special going on when you look at it a moment in time, but you add up their effects over the millions of years, over the billions of years, they've totally changed the Earth. So, say, so saying, let's jump, let's jump up a, a few billion years here and come up to uh, more modern times, 1880 to uh, present. So we're looking here at temperature increase. This is global land ocean temperature. This is from the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, a NASA facility associated with Princeton University. Th these, these kinds of things have been done independently by the Jap Japanese Meteorological Organization by the Hadley Climate Center in, in um, England, also by uh, the Weather Service in NOAA, and also by NASA. I just happened to pick out the NASA curve to make it a little bit cleaner. But what we're looking at here, each black square would be the average temperature, or the temperature at that specific year. And then in the red line here, we're, we're going to average it out over five years. So when you look at how the things go up and down, up and down, up and down, is that climate or is that weather? That, that's weather. And then what is climate? climate? Climate is weather averaged out over a long length of time. And a lot of the things you hear what people will say that they really get things mixed up and they'll say, huh, big snowfall in Atlanta, Georgia, that's not, not do you want to talk about global warming? Uh, no, that's weather. Weather's always unpredictable, always has funny, funny extremes. Climate is averaging it out <coughs> over a long time span. They say, the saying goes, uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Long time span versus short time span. So I've gone here just kind of for discussion terms. Uh, I've added some lines in here myself. But first, let's appreciate the thing as a whole. Here's 1880, and here's the temperature increase. You stand back and look at it, the temperature increase is quite obvious. Uh, now, I just sort of evened it out to say, notice that it's not constantly up. 1880 up here till uh, World War I times, you know, I, this is crude. I didn't, I didn't mathematically calculate this. I just put this up here. Visually speaking, if you take all the ups and downs, uh, climate change isn't really going on that much at that time. We go to this interval here, like from World War I, almost up to World War II, coincidentally. There's quite a bit of warming, and the, the astronomers have stepped forward to take some credit for that. According to their measurements, and everything in science is always under review and subject to change, but they're saying they, they believe the sun was putting out one quarter of a percent more energy during that time interval. So if that's the case, well, that would explain that warming interval right there. And then next, as we go through the uh, World War II time up here until around 19, the late 1970s, not really much change. And then the one that's always in the news now is here's where it's really taken off here. Uh, within the lifetimes of most of the people in this room, it really has taken off. And that's where all the stuff that's in the news all the time and people um, make their opinions on. I'm just here just showing the change. And if you follow this topic, you may have remembered that here from around the year 2000, we went through a several year span there where they didn't get a lot of temperature change. You remember people saying global warming is over, it stopped, it's all flattened out? Yes, it flattened out, but on the other hand, if you look at it, those are still the hottest years ever. So it didn't go away, it flattened out. And we think we know the answer to this now. Uh, so. Uh, carbon dioxide goes into solution in water. Is carbon dioxide going to go more carbon dioxide going to cold water or more going to warm water? And you probably run this experiment all the time. If you drink carbonated beverages, it's 
So if it's cold, you have a lot of gas in it, as it warms up, what happens? The gas escapes, goes flat. So what we have is a thing called the, uh, you've heard of El Nino, that's in the low latitudes, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We now can see that the northern Pacific Ocean was very cold during this interval, and that colder ocean water, among other things, means more carbon dioxide goes into solution into the ocean water. So again, it, I'm not saying this is absolute nailed down proof. The temperature trend absolutely is. Is global warming real? Absolutely. Anybody that says global warming isn't real, it, it's gotten to the point where you, you can hardly take it serious. Now, if you want to get down to the causes, when I say uh, this is the sun warming, uh, that's made, this we think might is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, but then things have taken off again, and now they're off the chart. Uh, these, are, these are illustrations from my textbook, but I don't have the latest <coughs> ones up here. So we're off on another very, very high one. The hottest years ever have been the last five years or so right here. So there's, there's the global warming. No real doubt about it. About it. Now the greenhouse effect, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but the basics of the greenhouse effect are sun comes in in short wavelengths. And those short wavelengths will go through clouds, will go through the atmosphere quite readily, and they'll warm up the ground surface, for example. When the ground surface gets real warm and it's, it's too hot, it's going to radiate energy, and it radiates it out in long wavelengths. And the long wavelengths, for example, can't go through clouds easily. They can't go through carbon dioxide or methane or other gases in the atmosphere. So that's it talking about the atmosphere. Uh, have you not been experiencing the greenhouse effect yourself here in the last few days? A little chillier outside, you parked the car, you came in and listened to Don Berry's lecture, you went out enthused and full of energy, and you got in your car, and what was the temperature? The warmer than it was, right? The what? The greenhouse effect. The short wavelength solar radiation passes through the glass, warms up the seat, warms up the dashboard, that gets so warm it starts radiating heat, but it radiates it out at long wavelength and it can't go through the window. So I mean, the greenhouse effect is part of our everyday experience. And on a global scale, it's these gases, carbon dioxide being one of them, when we talk about the, uh, the most. Okay, uh, I don't want you to read all this stuff here, but, but uh, just a little bit about, just a slight overview here. The fact that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas was recognized in the 1800s. Here's where the measurements on Hawaii began in 1958. And a computer model showing the effects of CO2 here in 1964, 54 years ago, it's just about as good as the ones that are coming out today. That, that, so the point being, not that they haven't done good work since then, but just trying to say that the overall picture is so apparent that it has been obvious for over 50 years. My favorite place to talk about uh, the modern climate change is the Arctic. I think it shows it better than any other place. And you remember, uh, so here, what, here's Greenland, here's the Arctic Ocean is in here, all this mess of ice and all. Remember the history classes about the European voyages of discovery, you know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, all, all that. And so they were, those European explorers, they couldn't get through the Arctic Ocean in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. For hundreds of years, they couldn't get through there. Uh, now what happens? Well, now it's, it's, a, it's quite easy now. Uh, here's a shot like from September 2011. So <clears throat> the largest oil tankers in the world go through here now in summertime. Remember when Japan got hit with that big earthquake and tsunami in 2011, knocked out their power system for the nation? Where they, how'd they run the country? Well, the Russians running oil tankers over here supply them with oil to keep them going. What explorers haven't been able to do for over 500 years, you can go buy a ticket on a luxury cruise ship, go there five star, you know, the finest cuisine you'd ever want to eat and everything, and you can cruise through the Arctic Ocean where nobody for hundreds of years before you could even go through there. So is, is global warming real? Well. What made that ice disappear? Heat. What other, what other explanation is there? Now I want to go back to this one now. So we're looking here, another shot of the Arctic, and I want to see about these changes. So 
here's the ice. And for the ice, it, here's this fancy word, albedo. It basically just means reflectance. You, you've, been, you've been on uh, snow or ice or whatever. You can be out there where it's cold, cold, cold. And then, and then what? You have to wear sunglasses because the light reflecting off of the ice or the snow is so bright. So uh, with the ice and snow, not only the ice not only cools the water, but it also is reflecting, reflecting the sunlight to help keep things cold. But you see in these pictures now, as more and more of the ocean is exposed, not covered with ice, what does the sun do when it hits the water? It doesn't reflect off as much. Much of that heat is stored in the water. So the warmer the water gets, the faster the ice melts from underneath. It's not just the sun melting it, but the water underneath the ice melting it. And so we start to get into think concepts like tipping points. Uh, let, let's, let's look a little bit here at Arctic sea ice. So here we're looking at, there's, a, there's always going to be a, a big change between summer and winter, right? Winter time in the Arctic, no sunshine, ice is going to form. Summertime, you get sunshine up to 24 hours a day, ice is going to melt. You're not going to change that. But, but here we're looking, that's what the, uh, the up and down swing of the blue lines are. That's winter versus summer. But here we're trying to average it out. Area of Arctic sea ice, uh, we're saying that 1979 is where this begins. 1979 is once we start having satellites and observation over the Arctic so we can see what's going on over the entire Arctic and we can measure and you can clearly see the decline both in the uh, winter time and in the summer time. And also this is ice thickness now, ice volume. And when we look at that, you see the same thing. You see the same marked declines over time. So the Arctic sea ice is disappearing. As it disappears, more solar energy is stored in the water, making it harder for ice to form again. So the question really is then, oh, here's a little diagram, a little cartoon from the Navy. But they're just trying to say that so much of the ice, here it is 1980, ice is kind of this thick. These are actual measurements, but th this is a cartoon here. And here's how thick it is in 2005. Obviously, the thinner it is, the uh, shorter a lifespan it should have. So it brings us to tipping points. Everybody's heard that term, tipping points. Uh, we, we, we love fads, right? Terms come in, they last for a few years, and they disappear. Please keep this one. I think tipping points is more than just a fad term. This is a huge, huge, I think, truth, if you will. And the basic of a tripping point means what? Small changes. We were just looking at, at how the ice on the Arctic, how it's going down little by little by little by little by year. We're also saying, well, the water's getting warmer and warmer by year. Well, what's the tipping point? The tipping point is where the water is so warm that you no longer have the ice. And uh, there's winners and losers in that. But a lot of the big losers are going to be, the whole weather is going to be radically different. Radically different. I'd like to spend more time going into that, but uh, you didn't sign up for the semester course, so I'll just have to keep moving here. Uh, so that's it. Here's that, tip, that tipping point where water gets too warm, too little bit of ice, then you get to the place where it's no longer the ice-covered ocean that we were used to. You still have a lot of ice in the winter, but in other words, you'll be able to run ships through there all year long, be part of the, of the whole world then. And here's another concept I want to bring up here. Uh, uh, we can talk about tipping points here too. When we take the ice cubes out of the freezer and set them on the counter, you've passed the tipping point. And once those things have started melting, <coughs> how do you stop it? Well, if it's ice cubes, you can put them back in the freezer. But what if, it, what if the ice cube is this mass covering Greenland? Where's the tipping point there? It's melting. I have no idea. Nobody has any idea. We're talking about concepts here, concepts. And so the ice is melting. We can measure that. That's, that's clearly shown. I, I could bring in a lot of numbers. But we'll just say the ice is, is uh, shrinking in volume. At what particular point, the ground's going to heat up more. At what particular point does, does, that, does that all, all melt? And that's not as wild as it sounds because North America had a big ice sheet. Scandinavia had a big ice sheet. <laughs> Siberia and Russia had a big ice sheet. Those all melted. This is the only piece that hasn't gone yet. 
if we pass the tipping point on that, global sea level will rise 23 feet. So if you uh, live in Mission Beach, don't sign two long-term leases. <laughs> uh, that's going to have a drastic effect on, on the world. Now, is this going to happen soon? I don't know. A century? I don't know. Two? I don't know. But the concept is there. Once, once you pass the tipping point, you can't pick it up and put it back in the freezer, and now you're going to deal with a new world. And uh, that it's just, what I'm trying to do here is just understand how the Earth works. It's the whole, whole concept. So that's another thing here that's, it took me a long time to wrap my mind around this one. If you haven't heard this one, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. I had to think about it for not just uh, time and hours, but times and days or weeks before I could fully appreciate this one. But <clears throat> you can read the words, but let me go to the next uh, diagram here. So, and this, this is a global, global, simplified global circuit of ocean water. This is from Wally Broker at Columbia University. Now, the red here, this is, it says warm shallow current. This is basically the winds blowing the warm surface waters around the earth. And the blue, this is the cold water. Cold water will sink beneath warm water, and uh, uh, salty water will sink beneath, will sink, as that's density. Uh, uh, movement. So if we look here now, let's, let's, let's get near us. Here, here, here's the U.S. Here's Florida. Here we're up here, Labrador, Canada. Here we are. Well, I guess we're covering Iceland right here. So let's say we're in Iceland. Uh, and uh, Don's leading another trip to Iceland you may, may want to sign up on, by the way. Uh, so look what happens here. This warm surface water that's come all the way over here from the... From the uh, uh, going all the way over here up to the northern Atlantic, and here it sinks, and then goes back down. Cold water, where it just says, absorbs more gas. So, I've led four trips around Iceland myself, and some up here <coughs> in the other uh, Arctic of Canada, and I like to tell the people there as they're drinking the champagne, and, 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 and I am too. I'm not saying don't drink champagne or don't drink bubbly water. I'm trying to say those bubbles going into the atmosphere there, going into the air, a lot of that's sinking into the water. That means it's gone down at depth. Now that means from, from that bubbly water you drank up here and the gas went into the water here, it's going down in the deeps and it's going to circulate all the way over here, come up to the surface maybe in the Indian Ocean or come up to the surface over here in the Northern Pacific Ocean. How long does that take? That's, that's about a thousand years. And it's kind of mind-blowing. Uh, again, this is philosophy, not politics. Uh, that means that means that champagne that Don Berry was guzzling up there in Iceland <laughs> is going to come up here and bugle people's lives a thousand years from now. <laughs> so, but, 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 but seriously, okay. Uh, seriously, it's just, like I said, it took me a while to get around to that. It just seems like these simple little things like that, how can that have an effect a thousand years later? Well, it makes sense when you think about it, because the CO2 dissolves in water so readily. And a major part of the ocean circulation is the dense water. Remember, the ocean is an average three miles depth. There's, there's, the deep waters are moving too. It's not just the surface waters. The surface waters are blown by the winds. The deep waters by density. The denser ones are pulled on more by gravity, and they go under the ones that are, are less dense. So we see a very much of a, of a changing Earth here. Um, oh, I put that in there to stop a look at the time. I guess I guess I can do a few more, few more minutes. <laughs> I'm on over here. So maybe, I'm on maybe four more slides. Uh, uh, world population. I'd like to go over that. Uh, in the discussions of global warming, I think one of the things that doesn't get discussed, because this is a topic people are afraid of. Politicians, religious leaders, citizens, everybody's afraid to discuss human population because you can offend people on the basis of nationality, religion, all kinds of ways you can offend people. I'm not labeling. I'm just talking about numbers of people. No other further labels. I don't care what country they are, what race they are, what religion they are, what gender they are, it doesn't matter. So if you look here at the growth of the population, well look here, in 2011, 
That was seven billion. There's 600, more, 600 million more people now seven years later. Now, I'm not talking about births. I'm talking about births minus deaths due to old age, war, disease. This is a net factor. I'm talking about a net. I'm not talking about uh, uh, just births alone. When you start looking at how, look at the time between it takes to add a billion people. In 1970, uh, 1960, in 14 years, we went from 3 billion to 4 billion. In 13 years, we went from 4 billion to 5 billion. In uh, 12 years, we went to 6 billion. 12 more years, we're at 7 billion. Uh, in terms of human effect on the climate, I said, well, for one thing, look at numbers. And this discussion has gotten waylaid by people wanting to make it rich versus poor. That doesn't really matter either, frankly. Every human being alive is, 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 is doing it. So it's, it's numbers as a primary importance. The other sub-labels, I, I don't even really want to get into. Now what I do here on my, uh, I call this, this is from my textbook, this is my drawing. Uh, I, I call it the only honest one around. Because when you see these curves, they always do them on logarithmic curves. And when you do it on logarithms, what's the population growth look like? It looks like this. Well, let's do it real. So here's 160,000 years ago, 120, 80,000, so forth. Here's uh, billions of people coming up this way. If you plot it, it's not even a curve. That's human population growth right there. In other words, it's absolutely unprecedented. Never in the history of life on Earth uh, has anything gone up as fast as the number of human beings are going. I have no answers. I have no recommendations. I'm merely pointing out that the human population growth uh, let's see, in um, 2050, what's that, 32 years? Add, add 32 years to whatever your age is. I don't think I will. That'll put me over 100. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and do that. Uh, and then the Earth will have passed 10 billion population. So uh, it's just, it's, it's sobering. It's sobering, that's all. Uh, this will be the last one. So here's projections. You see, here, here the projections for a year, uh, last decade of this century, and here's warming in degrees centigrade. So that's, you're going to multiply that type by 1.8 to get to Fahrenheit. So we're looking up here then at that, that things, we look up here in the Arctic and saying average annual temperatures up there would be on the order of 13 degrees hotter than they are now. And you look at the whole Earth, here's, you see the scale down here. So the Earth doesn't get heated equally. The cold water going around Antarctica still stays you know, colder than the rest of the world, but you see a very different world than we're used to now. Now that's a computer projection. That doesn't mean this is exact, but, the, but every computer projection that is done comes out with things that clearly show warming throughout the Earth, and they always also show that the greatest warming is up at the uh, Arctic region. So that's kind of... Um, uh, we skipped a lot of other parts of carbon dioxide in Earth history, but going from 500 degrees down to where we are at 61 degrees now, I guess. Uh, oh, you know, I'm going to say one last thing, because this is a STEM thing. We've caught up in the geology and all these things. But this is a STEM thing. Uh, excuse me. This is a STEM gathering for people looking for careers and interested in STEM. And let me point out then that, that this, I'm going to say, this is going to be the biggest debate or biggest feature of the 21st century. So if any aspect of climate and climate change you find interesting, be it, be it whether you're in biology and whether you're in geology or, or whatever topic area you're in, the, the things to be solved and understood are enough that I could guarantee you an entire career if you did choose to go that way. So in terms of a practical sense, a career sense of looking at things, a, a, a climate is not something that's going to go away. It's not political. It doesn't matter which party's in, in power or whatever else goes on. And, with wars in the world, this is going to go on simply because uh, more and more people and more and more of those people are using more and more energy and more and more of the kinds of things <coughs> that, that we enjoy. Okay, I guess um, I guess I better stop there and move away from the door. And um, thank you very much. For your